Christ the Lord. Come, thou long-expected Jesus, born to set thy to our, uh, our candlelight service. We are excited that you're here. Advent uh, is, the, is the time of the year, the church calendar that leads up to Christmas. In this past month, past month we've been talking about uh, the one, the one who brings light, the one who prophesies, the one who redeems. This morning we talked about the one who saves, and all those characteristics are about the one, Jesus the one who we're here to celebrate his life tonight. And we're going to discuss the one who triumphs tonight. So I want to keep singing to our Savior, to our God with Jesus, the one who triumphs. Let's pray and then, and then jump back in. Lord, thank you so much for the birth of your son. Thank you for our ability to celebrate it, Lord, and thank you for these songs that we can sing to praise you. Give us hope, joy, 
love and peace. It's in your son's name we pray, amen. Angels from the realms of glory Shall pierce him through the cross. 
to be prepared to live in expectant waiting for you and your return. As we celebrate the day that you were born to be a savior for us all. Father, we love you. We ask all of this in your holy and precious name. of an innocent life to pay the penalty for our failures seems like too negative of a thing to talk about during a festive holiday season, huh? Instead, we focus our attention on uh, family, singing Christmas carols, spending money to stimulate the economy. That's what Christmas looks like through our eyes. But what if we could look at the birth of Jesus from the perspective of heaven? Would we see things any differently? Would we emphasize the same things about Christmas if we were looking at it through heaven's eyes? Fortunately, we don't have to guess on that. Because the Bible presents us with a picture of Christmas through heaven's eyes. This picture isn't found in the traditional Christmas story as recorded in, in Luke or Matthew. It's not even found in the more theologically dense retelling of John. Heaven's perspective of Christmas is found in the book of Revelation. Revelation provides a, an interpretation of Christmas and one day, while in prayer, uh, John experiences an incredible vision of Jesus Christ, where he sees the gates of heaven open. And one of the major purposes of this vision is to help us see the pain and suffering from heaven's perspective. This vision recounted in the book of Revelation sheds light on the future. It uses symbolism, images, Visions to describe the end of, of human, human history, the future coming of Jesus Christ. And in chapter 12 of Revelation, we experience a heavenly flashback to the first Christmas. This flashback looks back at the birth of Jesus, which probably occurred 80 years before John had this vision. It lifts a curtain and shows John and us what the first Christmas looked like from heaven's perspective. Read along with me. Silently, by the way, because... <laughs> and a great sign appeared in heaven. A woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and her head, on her head a crown of twelve stars. 
She was pregnant and was crying out in birth pains and the agony of giving birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great red dragon with seven heads and ten horns, and on his head, uh, on his head seven diadems. His tail swept down a third of the stars from heaven and cast them to the earth. The dragon stood before the woman who was about to give birth, so that when she bore the child, he might devour it. She gave birth to a male child. One who's to rule all the nations with a rod of iron, but her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Now war arose in heaven, Michael and his angels fighting against the dragon, and the dragon and his angels fought back, but he was defeated, and there was no longer any place for them in heaven, and the great dragon was thrown down, that ancient serpent who is called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. Now, now every Christmas morning, that's the Christmas story you should read to your children. Right? <laughs> but such an interesting version, right? So I want to look through it. First, we're introduced to a woman who is clothed with the sun. Exactly who this woman is has been, has been debated by Christians for generations. Some identify it as Eve, who's the mother of all of the human race. In Genesis 3, it says that God made a promise that he will send a son through her lineage that will stomp the snake's head. Jesus Christ. Others identify this woman as the nation of Israel, and that's why the 12 stars would stand for the 12 tribes, and the focus would be on God using the nation of Israel to bring his son into the world. Still others see it less symbolically. It's Mary. She had a baby. It's Jesus. That's who it is. Now, I'm not here to tell you which one it is, but the, uh, because visions in, in Revelation can have all types of things, but maybe the woman can refer to Eve, Israel, and Mary all at once. So let's hold on on that character. Second character, we have a child that is born to this woman. Now, clearly, this is Jesus, Jesus Christ, God's Son. And the book of Revelation is rich with imagery to describe Jesus, calling him the beginning and the end, calling him the lamb that was slain for the world's sins, the conquering king, a lion, all those things. And that's because the book of Revelation is first and foremost a revelation of Jesus Christ. An unveiling of Christ's true character. And here the focus is Jesus' birth. Now, if you look in your Bible at the end of cha- uh, sorry, uh, verse 5, there is a skip from his birth to his ascension. And John is bracketing his entire life in between those two things. And this is a way of presenting the life of Jesus as a comprehensive work. He was born into the world. He lived a perfect life. He died a sacrificial death for our sins on Good Friday. He rose uh, from the grave on Easter, and he ascended into heaven at the sight of his followers, promising his return. The third major character, probably my son's favorite because he's six, is the dragon. A grotesque, seven-headed dragon. Now, through the whole ancient world, there are myths and legends about dragons and and, and monster-like things that are retold this way. But the dragon here in John is called a sign, which which means it's a symbol for something else. And verse 9 identifies that symbol as Satan, the personification of evil. Satan is a real supernatural being who has at his disposal a third of the angels as well as power and authority. And when Jesus is born into this world, Satan is waiting to destroy him. And while shepherds are watching and angels are singing and wise men are worshiping, Satan is waiting to make his move. How's that for a vision of Christmas morning? 
looking at it from this perspective, from heaven's perspective, should give us four insights. Four insights we wouldn't normally see if we read through Matthew's version and Luke's version. Potentially, at the end of this, tomorrow morning, if you read the Christmas story with your family, maybe you'll choose this one. I don't think so, but you might. Number one, the birth of Jesus Christ was a declaration of war. From heaven's perspective, the birth of Jesus Christ was a declaration of war. The words Christmas and war shouldn't go together. We tend to picture the birth of Jesus as a tranquil, quiet, and peaceful event. I've seen one child born in this world. That is not how it goes. We picture shepherds in in wordless wonder gazing at Jesus, uh, animals silently milling around. We even sing songs that say, no crying he makes. In silent night, the whole world is holding its breath in wonder, but the unseen world, all hell is breaking loose. And God finally seeks to wrestle creation from the power of evil. The birth of Jesus was the launch of of God's assault on the power of evil. Eugene Peterson says about this verse specifically, this is not the nativity story we grew up with. Jesus' birth excites more than wonder. It excites evil. Evil's clearly in our world. Look at the conflicts that are in the world today. The next thing we need to see from this perspective is that the birth of Jesus brought the world's rightful ruler to earth. Jesus was the rightful king of earth from the day of his birth, which is why Herod tried to destroy him. Yet Jesus wasn't just the king of the Jews, the rightful heir to David's throne in Israel. Jesus is the king of kings. Lord of lords, the ruler, the creator of the entire universe. And until Jesus assumes his rightful throne over this world, every other person, every other leader, every other political figure will be imperfect and inadequate. As earnest and as eager we are to rid the world of horrible acts, we'll never be able to bring about lasting peace that the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, will bring to this world. 